of, there's a lot of, it's a very useful term. If you understand, if you don't define it in such a way that you, you whisk it off the stage of functionality altogether. Right, but, but when you say, we talk about the, the roles consciousness plays, the things consciousness does, you believe that in all those cases, you could just substitute the workings of the brain and have the same statement, right? It's just like life. I can talk about what life is on the planet, what life enables on the planet, and what the difference is between being alive and dead. But in every case, I could get rid of the word alive and just talk in terms of the functioning of the metabolism of the cells and the, and the, and the unity of the, of the operations of the, uh, of the, you know, the coherence of the operations of self-preservation and so forth. And life isn't some other thing. It's not something over and above all those functional details, and I'm saying consciousness is just like life. Well, that's what I, when I say it boils down to the question of whether you consider consciousness publicly observable or inherently private phenomena, that's kind of what divides us on this, and, and you and a lot of people. I mean, Well, I, don't, I think it's, it, I mean, it's this, not normally publicly observable in, in, in the same way that, that uh, let's say, that the metabolism of a person is... How, a lot of that's private too, but 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 you can you can get out your your no, but your you can in principle look at it. Yeah, yeah. You know, and that's and, and and you say you know there are lots of states of things that we give new words to. Yes, but in all of those cases, no one disputes that in principle it's publicly observable. In yeah. this case, tons of people dispute that consciousness is publicly observable. Well, all right, and that's kind of the crux, and and uh, it's why um, as is happening here, people who disagree fail to persuade each other. They just have a yeah, fundamentally yeah. different, it's almost at an intuitive level. So, um, so you want to call it a truth? Uh, Probably or, we should call it a truth to talk about something else. Something yeah. else. Um, do you, um, do you manage to be a good person? Um, I, I think I'm, in your, in I your, think I'm, in your objective you know, judgment. Well, I mean, like all the children in Lake Wobegon, I think I'm above average yeah. in, in morality. Oh, yeah. congratulations. <laughs> Ab above average for, for a bright or for a... Or for no, a, for... Uh, 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 you're about an I don't... I, I, uh, you know, there's the things I've done that are wrong. I've got my little bits of guilty conscience, but I don't think I've done anything very, very bad. And I, I think I've done a lot of good. I, I, I guess the question is... You don't see belief in God, or, or even belief in, in any kind of higher power, or even a belief in a transcendent foundation for morality. You don't you don't see any of that. That's really necessary well, as far as as far as creating good behavior. Goes. Let's talk about transcendent uh -oh. and morality. Um, one of the things that we have evolved to discover on this planet is arithmetic. We didn't invent it. We didn't make it. We found it. Mm -hmm. It is eternal, a priori, true. It's, it's just great stuff. And it's true everywhere in the universe. It's true everywhere in any universe. There's only one arithmetic. Now, is that is that transcendent? I would say, yeah, that's... I don't know for sure what you mean so by it's transcendent. Kind of like a platonic thing that was it's sort of, yeah, it's this sort of Platonism. And, and, and uh, we I mean, uh, happened upon its truth. We've... We've discovered it, and it's true. Now, could there be a sort of similarly Platonic ethics? Could we find the the universal principles of good behavior for intelligent beings? I'm agnostic about that. I don't see why we couldn't. I don't see that that the parochialism of of our concerns uh, would necessarily stand in the way of. I mean, we can we can ask. We can ask the same question about ethics that we ask about arithmetic. If we went to another planet, if, if the search for intelligent life, extraterrestrial life that was intelligence, if this, if this paid off, um, if we discovered another civilization somewhere in, you know, in the galaxy that was intelligent, what would that share with us? What would certainly share arithmetic? Maybe not base 10 arithmetic. That's, that's anybody's mm -hmm. guess. Uh, it might be base 12 or base 16 or base 8. Who knows? Um, that's an accident. But it would still be arithmetic. Now, we can say, and would it share ethical principles with us? And I think, in some regards, yes, it would. 
I, now, does that make those principles transcendent? Yeah. It's not, it's not might makes right, and it's not this is what our grandfathers did, so this is what we're going to do. It's not just historical accident. I think that there c could be a truly universal basis for ethics. You mean that to get to, to a point where any species could pr produce these great kind of collective products, which technologies and things are, they would have to come up with rules of the road for, for collaborative, cooperative sure, interaction. Sure. Okay, and is that... Um, it's, like, it's like the evolution of cooperation. Right, yeah. very, very much. Yeah. And, and uh, I mean, you could almost say that it's, it's like a, I don't know, um, and, uh, and, and I talked about this with Steve Pinker a little, too, who, who, um, who discusses it in, um, I think, one of his books. The, the um, I don't know if he used the phrase strange attractor, but it's kind of like, it's kind of like a, a, a truth that's out there. It's an attractor, that, yeah. That yeah. certain kinds of evolution are going to happen mm -hmm. upon when they get in the vicinity. Now, it's what I call a good trick with a capital G, capital T in, in Darwin's Dangerous Idea. Right. There are these good tricks of design which are going to be discovered again and again and again because they are simply, they are the eternal good tricks. Arithmetic's one. Yeah. I think ethics now, is another. Now, that, now, now what if, what if uh, somebody noted this by way of suggesting that that adds to the evidence that evolution had some purpose? If it naturally happens upon something that even you would agree is moral truth, Okay, natural selection produces, is likely to produce a species that happens upon moral truth. Doesn't that lend credence to the argument that maybe there was some point to the whole exercise? I don't think so. No. I was kind of thinking you might say that. <laughs> I don't no, know. no, it just happens. And we can explain we why it up. happens. Um, does, uh, does death bother you? You, you? you said that one definition of a, of a bright, this, this, uh, this, emerging interest group to which you yeah. proudly belong um, is that they don't believe in life after death. Yeah. Is that, would you rather there were life after death? No, I'd rather live to be a thousand. <laughs> but, but I, um, uh, but then if you died at a thousand, what would be your preferences for an afterlife? No, um, I think the concept of an afterlife is a, is a very useful fantasy for handling the grief of small children and others and I don't disparage it. I think it takes it takes a very strong and brave person to to take on the task of comforting a, a child whose parent has just died, for instance. Um, and the consolation value of believing that mommy's up there watching you is is uh, Boy, that's that's a that's a lifeboat in the storm, if ever there was one. It is so transparently useful at times like that right. that um, I dare say that is enough to explain its popularity as an idea uh, for our species for all time. Yeah. The by the way, there is hope here. I'm gonna. Here's a quote from. Um, Actually, a book called Consciousness Explained, written by you. If what you are is the program that runs on your brain's computer, then you could in principle survive the death of your body as intact as a program can survive the destruction of a computer on which it was created and first run. Yeah, yeah. in fact, um, uh, my friend Marvin Minsky has uh, uh, invested, I think, a large part of his Japan prize in the uh, cryogenics contract of some sort so that his body or at least his brain can be can be kept in cold storage against some imagined future time when uh, when when he could be brought back to life so that he could enjoy the you know 25th century science or something like that and i i i appreciate the motivation for this i suppose if i had had a few million to burn i might i might think of 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 whether i might consider whether i would do that the technology right now is nowhere near uh, uh, and he knows that too. Uh, it's not. It's not in position now to to make that a very realistic uh, mm. project. So I think that it is just as likely that you could uh, store all the information in your body. I can store it on a hard disk, and then build another one sometime in the future. 
uh, fixing just the parts that need fixing, and that would be a way of bringing you back to life. Yeah, 